Gwe, hello, and thanks for joining me. I'm honored to be part of the Veganism of Color Conference. I want to particularly thank Julia for including me in this, um, and I want to thank veganismofcolor.com. I'll start by telling you a little bit about who I am. I'll start in Mi'kmaq, and then I'll switch into English. So, Gwe, Nindele Wizimugdush, Lewet Eskigawage, Lewet Mi'kmaqi, which means, hi, my name's Margaret, and I'm from uh, Mi'kmaqi. Mi'kmaqi is the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Uh, we live on the eastern coast of what's currently North America. And we call ourselves the Elnu, which means the people. My identity as an Elnu has been shaped by my relationship with the land and with the people who share it with me. And when I say people, I don't mean just the human people. I mean the animals as well. The folks we call the people who walk, the people who crawl, the people who swim, and the people who fly. Mi'kmaq, we refer to this as Masit Nogama, all my relations. I'm a vegan, and I root my veganism in my Mi'kmaq cultural values. And today I'm going to talk briefly about food sovereignty, by which I mean the ability of Indigenous people to live our values in relation to food. If you don't remember anything from this talk, um, and I hope that's not the case, but if you don't remember anything, um, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, I hope you'll remember three key points. First, Mi'kmaq values include animal personhood. I'll say more about what that is um, and how it supports veganism in a bit. My second point is that colonialism intentionally destroys food economies, particularly indigenous food economies. And I'll talk about how it does that and why. And then finally, I argue that decolonizing our diet supports food sovereignty. And um, I'll explain why that is and why we should want it. I'll start with my first point, that Mi'kmaq values include seeing animals as people. Um, usually in Western philosophy, animals are viewed as objects that can be uh, sold for profit. So Western philosophers, philosophers like Immanuel Kant treated uh, animals as um, beings who were a means to an end, not an end in themselves. And so when we talk to people who are raised in a Western tradition about veganism, a lot of those assumptions from uh, Western philosophy about who animals are and what the human relationship to animals should be gets dragged along with that conversation. And so there can be a lot of baggage there that isn't getting unpacked. The teachings I receive from my family and my culture frame animals as self-aware, rational beings uh, whose existence is for themselves rather than for us. And one of the ways I access those traditional values is through our stories. Some of my favorite involve Blue's Cap. Uh, he's sort of like a cultural Superman. He's smart and honest and generous and respectful and caring. Uh, and strong, he's um, sort of the, the first Mi'kmaq person. And one story tells of the creation of an old woman, Nagumi, from a dewy rock. And Nagumi is Gluskap's grandmother. And she agrees to provide him with wisdom in exchange for food. Nagumi says that she requires meat. Uh, she explains she can't live on plants and berries alone, which presumably Gluskap did before her arrival. And so Gluskap calls upon his friend Abistanoich uh, to help him out. Abistanoich is the American pine marten. And here I'm going to bring up a screen to give you an idea of what the American pine marten looks like. So this is Abistanoich. Um, <clears throat> in the story, uh, Gluskap asks Abistanoich um, if he will help out by sacrificing himself so that Gluskap's grandmother can live. Um, so in the story, she uh, kills the fine Martin, and immediately Gluskap feels bad about this and wants out of the arrangement. So he asks his grandmother to play, pray to the creator, and Martin returns to life leaving a body of another Martin behind, available to be eaten, without all the messy feelings of guilt and loss entailed in the death of a friend. 
happiness. So one of the things I like about this story is that uh, it seems like before Glooskap's grandmother comes along, Glooskap's eating a plant-based diet, and animals are his friends, not food. And although it does feature meat-eating and tries to kind of justify it in the story, uh, the justification they offer isn't that Martin looks tasty. Uh, it's not pleasure-based. It's survival-based. Uh, they frame it as Glooskap's grandmother needs this to live. Reading this story, I reason that if I don't need to eat other animals to survive, which I don't, because um, I have easy access to lots of plant-based food, uh, then there's no justification within my Mi'kmaq culture for continuing to do so. In fact, there's every justification for living as Glooskap seems to in the start of the story, eating a plant-based diet and being friends with the animals. So my first point, that Mi'kmaq values include seeing animals as other people, um, is one that I've drawn directly from these kind of stories. I also like connecting up the values I see in our stories with the values and ideas that come from the work of Indigenous scholars. So Andrea Smith has argued that white supremacy rests on three pillars. The first of these is the stolen labor of black bodies, slavery. Uh, and by this, I refer to the literal kidnapping and enslaving of people, but also to profit systems that treat people as the economic property of the state. So for instance, the prison industrial complex. The second pillar Smith identifies is the genocide of indigenous people. In order to frame the land as empty and a thing that settlers can just take, uh, you need to eliminate the indigenous people from the picture um, and then treat this extinction as natural selection rather than something that you intentionally did. Smith's third pillar is what Smith calls Orientalism. Essentially, she refers to the need for the state to always have a threatening other against which it must defend itself. And Smith highlights the ways that colonialism interlocks with racism and imperialism. So things like our economic policy, our foreign policy, um, and uh, state policies uh, all work together. My second point then is that colonialism intentionally destroys food economies. And it fits into the second pillar that Smith describes of genocide. But we see similar efforts by the state to control and shape the diet of other racialized people. And if you're interested in that, I recommend that you read the work of A. Breeze Harper and Conju Briggs Jr. I think they do a great job of exploring it in pretty good detail. I'll give you a heads up. Uh, the next picture has a big pile of animal skulls in it. So if you're squicked by that, uh, look away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was a bit of noise again. Uh, here are the skulls. Smith frames genocide as including killing the animals that form the basis of indigenous food economies. So here we see an example of the buffalo, uh, which were intentionally killed by settlers in order to starve indigenous nations into surrendering their territory. This photo was taken at a time when the bison population dropped to about a thousand, down from a pre-contact estimate of 60 million. So one of the side effects of this has been to strain and break the relationship between indigenous people and the animals that share our territories. Um, until in some cases we see animal personhood as a cultural value gets replaced altogether by the settler mindset uh, that frames animals as an economic resource that we have to fight over. I see this in uh, the historic fur industry where we hunted beaver to near extinction. Um, and I also see it in contemporary fights over control of the fishing industry. In both cases, animals are being treated as objects whose bodies can be owned and sold for profit. When we lose a traditional food economy, we also lose all the cultural and spiritual elements that are connected to it. So before colonization, indigenous people had complex food economies that functioned well with the local ecosystem. We cultivated plants in ways that mesh seamlessly with the other plants around them. In some cases, settlers assumed that this food just grew wild rather than accept that the abundance they saw was the result of intentional practices on the part of indigenous people. A classic example of indigenous plant science is the uh, trio sometimes referred to as the three sisters. Corn, beans, and squash provide ecological and nutritional balance. Uh, corn has a tall, sturdy stalk, 
but it requires high nutrients, which can deplete the soil. Planting beans alongside corn enhances the availability of nitrogen in the soil by cultivating beneficial bacteria. And these bacteria pull nitrogen from the air and convert it into a form that the plant can use. The pole bean climbs the corn stalk as it grows, giving the beans better access to the sun. And then finally, the broad leaves that the squash plant grows provides a blanket of living mulch, which acts as a barrier against weeds, against hot sun and high temperatures, holding the moisture close to the ground. And then the prickly hairs on the squash uh, help reduce rodent and insect attacks on the growing plants. The corn bean squash trio is also nutritionally complementary. It's got a mix of sugar, protein, and fiber. So that's indigenous nutritional science. Uh, and here's a meme from the internet where we make fun of it. Um, as indigenous people get pushed off our territories, access to our traditional foods gets reduced and our economies of food get damaged. So here we see this example. It's a meme from Decolonial Meme Queens, uh, and it shows a take on the Three Sisters. Here it says, the Three Sisters of Indigenous Cuisine, these sacred foods have sustained our families since time immemorial. But instead of corn, beans, and squash, we've got Kraft Dinner, ketchup, and wieners. Um, so what is this about? Why is this decolonial uh, in any way? It's because the eating habits of Indigenous people have been so heavily colonized. Researchers note the reserve system results in a diet high in sugar and carbohydrates and low in protein and fiber. And as a result, indigenous people all over North America have had an increase in diabetes and gallstones and other serious health problems. Professor of Human Ecology Kim Travers sees three reasons for the nutrient-poor diet among the Mi'kmaq, my people. The first of these is economic oppression. Most of us have very low incomes. In 2015, the average income for First Nations people in Canada was just over $15,000, while for Canada as a whole, it was just over $71,000. So, big difference there. Second, the Mi'kmaq often lack access to transportation, so it's harder to go to a farmer's market or a large store. Um, so this is often the case of lacking access to vehicles. And then third, reserves are situated on land that, in general, isn't suitable for agriculture. Uh, so we can't grow our own food. It's one of the reasons uh, that land was chosen for reserves in the first place, was because settlers couldn't farm there. So Mi'kmaq people who live in reserve are often limited to eating processed protein, like peanut butter, wieners, or bologna. Colonialism has trained us to think that our poverty and the strategies we use to continue to live um, are in some ways indigenous. So you'll see indigenous restaurants sometimes that have uh, canned meat wrapped in fry bread on their menu. What we're doing is we're traditionalizing our own poverty. Fry bread is not an indigenous food. It's a food our ancestors invented to deal with government rationing. Uh, so the government provided lard and flour, but not meat or vegetables. And so we invented fry bread. It's not good for you, kind of like a big donut, uh, tastes pretty good, um, not very healthy. Half of all indigenous people now also live in cities. So most of us don't access traditional food or even know where to get it. And the ability to maintain our traditional food knowledge and to express our traditional food values in a new setting is a key piece in maintaining our culture. The solution to the problem, as I see it, is food sovereignty. La Via Campanisa, an international farmers group, defines food sovereignty as the rights of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. The focus on food sovereignty is about changing the power structure that keeps people from having agency over their own food. So my third point here is that decolonizing our diet supports food sovereignty. Changing how we eat changes how we experience our bodies. Bodies that get proper nutrition are healthier and usually live longer. And if you look at the statistics, you'll see that indigenous people do not live as long as non-indigenous people. And food is a big part of that. Understanding how what we eat is shaped by colonialism is a long process. 
but I think it's one that's worth the effort. For me, it's not enough to be vegan and read the ingredients on a box before I buy it. I also have to think about whether my vegan diet is made up of foods that were grown using stolen labor and stolen land. Um, so that's an important part of maintaining my connection to my cultural values in my vegan diet. Food sovereignty also helps us decolonize ourselves spiritually. And by this I mean it helps us preserve the relationships with other animals that are part of our original understanding of the world as Indigenous people. Um, so we step away from approaches that make other animals into objects that can be collected and sold for profit. It helps us return to a recognition that we're all part of a web of intercollected life and that that web uh, supports our survival as human beings. So I'll end here with a reminder of the three points. Uh, Mi'kmaq personhood uh, is, uh, Mi'kmaq values include animal personhood. Colonialism intentionally destroys indigenous food economies. And decolonizing our diet supports food sovereignty. Uh, if you're interested in reaching me and talking more about food sovereignty and veganism and indigenous culture, I welcome you to send me an email. My email address is mrobinson at dal.ca. Uh, you can also just Google Margaret Robinson and you'll probably find me there as well. Switch back to, okay, stop sharing. I'm not very technologically advanced, I'm afraid. Okay. Okay, <laughs> um, <I missed it. laughs> I'll, uh, say thanks and Wilalin uh, to Julia for giving me the opportunity to talk to all of you. And I'll say Wilali Yolk and thanks to all of you for your patience and time. Uh, and uh, thank you, Karina, for uh, providing the translation. <laughs>